Today, we've got a really special conversation about one of Australia's most exquisite songbirds, the purple crowned fairy wren. And I'm really excited to be talking to two of the experts on this species and fairy wrens in general, Professor Anne Peters and Dr. Nikki Tunison. Um, Professor Anne Peters is a longtime collaborator with AWC. She leads a research group at Monash University looking at the behavioural and evolutionary ecology of birds. And her group has published over 100 peer reviewed research papers, most of them on fairy wrens. And Dr. Peters also serves as a member of AWC's Science Advisory Network. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Joey. I'm very happy to be here, albeit a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. It's been a while since any of us has done a webinar. So, yes. Fine. Um, and Dr. Nikki Tunison, who completed both her master's and PhD on these birds up in the Kimberley. Uh, so Nikki works in the same research group at Monash University. Thanks for tuning in, Nikki from the Kimberley. Thanks for having me, Joey. Welcome. And I'd like to start with you and about the, the broad interest of the research topics that your lab investigates. You've said you're driven by a desire to understand the natural world. Can you tell me what sort of questions you look at in your group? Yes, yes, that's very accurate. So it's a desire to understand the natural world and in particular to, to understand the, uh, the behavior of, of our, our lovely wildlife uh, against the backdrop of their ecology and trying to understand it from an evolutionary perspective, which means we ask why questions. So why are they doing what they're doing? Why are purple girls purple? Why do they sing duets? Why do they hang out in groups, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the thread that weaves through my, uh, my research program is uh, to uh, try and understand how these wild free living individuals balance their investment in, on the one hand, the need to procreate so the investment in sex, if you will, and on the other hand, the investment in uh, maintaining themselves, so self-preservation, their health, uh, their, um, their survival. And um, so these questions uh, uh, have, so the balance of that investment has consequences for individual population, uh, for individual fitness mm -hmm. and for population persistence. So it started off as a deep interest in understanding individuals, because I'm a simple person and I can understand individuals, but automatically if you try and understand the factors that drive individual success, you will end up understanding the factors that drive population success and population persistence. And the, sorry, yeah. the way we get at that is um, through looking at individuals throughout life. So that's, that's my passion. I think that the long-term nature of this research is, is really key. And that's something that distinguishes this work on purple crowned fairy wrens. It's one of the longest running uh, studies on a population of birds in Australia, certainly the longest on AWC properties. Um, and I think that that detail that you touched on is fascinating because in a lot of conservation ecology, we're looking at the population level at how numbers are going and where they are. But your work drills right down into the lifespan of individual birds of you know where their chicks go what they're feeding on how that affects their genetics how habitat you know shapes their behavior um really intensive detail um so i think that's that's a really interesting aspect to your work yes thanks i i agree <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. It's, uh, it's, I think um, one of the things of looking at that level of detail, um, firstly, we, we're all very passionate and we're very deeply interested in that and it's, it's great work to do, but also it allows you to understand the broader trends. So we're looking at, at the mechanisms and if we understand how impacts take place, um, maybe we can start picking away at very targeted actions. Mm. to um to target those mechanisms so where it happens so to speak and before it happens even better that's my current aim yes yeah and we'll, we'll get to the conservation implications of the work a little later um the group that you've chosen to focus on for for much of your career has been the fairy wrens and people will be familiar probably with superb fairy wrens or splendid fairy wrens if you live in the west um, the, the charming little mostly blue and black uh, male birds or the you know light brown female birds that you might see really in, in most of Australia's large cities there's a species of fairy wren so they're familiar to us and I think at you know first appearance they seem to be very charming 
innocent, delightful little birds. But there's a, a deeper story. Um, what goes on in fairy wren society under cover of darkness? Uh, yes. So, so fairy wrens, as you say, they fascinated you know just people since a long time and they on the, on the surface of it lead a very harmonious life so uh, they the male and the female pair up and then uh, they live together very much like humans in a little family group with some uh, often some previous offspring that will help feed the young and they have a, a fixed territory that's very strongly defended and there the family lives together very harmoniously we see very little acrimony very little aggression um, but um, a, a, a few decades ago, people started uh, a genetic analysis, genetic parentage analysis, which works the same in birds as it does in humans. It allows you to determine the genetic parents of the offspring. And what we found is that the, the, uh, the social fathers of those young are very often not the genetic fathers. So uh, what happens evidently is that there are goings on on the side on, a, on an epic scale, more or less, in uh, particularly superb fairy wrens. Um, you know, all females are to some extent unfaithful to their social partner and more than three quarters of young are not related to the male that raises them. Uh, and from radio tagging, we know that the females sneak out under the cover of darkness uh, to find their beloved male of their, uh, that, that they favor and then go back home and pretend nothing happened. Right, so sort of, I think this has been described as kind of social monogamy. You know, they, by all appearances, they have a, you know, a partner, a long-term uh, faithful partner, um, but sexually these are promiscuous birds. So that's, that's yes. you know, for one thing, fascinating in its own right. I think there's scope here for a Netflix dramatization of the, the secret lives of fairy wrens. Um, Absolutely. And interestingly, that's the case for the superb fairy wrens you mentioned, but yeah, yeah. there's a, a species that the one we're talking about today, which is quite different. And Nikki, I might bring you into the conversation at this point. Um, one of the reasons that we think there are differences in these breeding systems is to do with habitat. So would you like to start just by telling us about your study site, about where you work, what that looks like, and, and what conditions are like on the ground at Mornington Wildlife Sanctuary in the Kimberley? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so um, Mornington is in the central Kimberley, um, and they're the population of the burp ground fairings that we study. They live along 15 kilometers of waterways in Annie Creek and the Atco River at Mornington. And so these birds are what we call habitat specialists. So they only live in riparian habitat. Um, so that's the habitat that's found along creek lines. Um, and they rely on pandanus. So it's the spiky palm like vegetation that you can see in your background there. <laughs> that's it. Um, so that's the habitat that these fair ends need to find their food. It's where they build their nests, where they find protection from predators, things like that. Um, so the Mornington itself is characterized by tropical savanna, but because these birds live on the waterways, the vegetation there is actually quite dense and very spiky and the weather is hot and it's characterized by a dry season and a wet season. <laughs> There's me in the middle of all the pandanus. Um, yeah, so during the wet season, we can get quite a lot of rain and uh, a lot of that habitat gets flooded a lot as well. Um, and what I'm doing in that photo there is I'm actually, I've taken a ladder out into the field with me to try to access one of the fair nests because they often tuck their nest away right into the base of those pandanus crowns. Right, so the, the habitat here is a, a critical part of the story. And um, one of the, you know, this is a beautiful creek, Annie Creek. If you've been lucky enough to visit Mornington, it runs right through next to the research station and the accommodation at Mornington. Um, so it's a, a kind of lush little oasis in what is, you know, mostly dry savannah country. And this habitat provides, you know, very effective shelter. These are spiky pandanus trees, as I'm sure you can attest. You know, they, these are habitat speci specialists, these birds that live only along watercourses. And that means their habitat is this, this kind of linear pattern. How does that affect their, their breeding systems and how they behave? Right, yeah. So it's, it's one of the key ways in which the purple crown fairings differ from all the other species of fairing. Um, 
So because these Burbicon Farrens are restricted to the waterways, their, ter their home territories are arranged in a linear fashion. So there will be one territory after the other along the creek line, like beads on a string, essentially. Um, and we think that this is the reason that they're faithful instead, and they're not promiscuous like those other farrens that um, Anne was just talking about. Um, so in other farren species, their territories are arranged in a mosaic pattern. So what that means is that there's many more neighbors around to visit and to potentially cheat on your partner with. So we think that it's the purple ground farren's ecology, uh, them being restricted to waterways that makes them faithful instead. That's, that's so interesting that where they live can change their whole social system. These birds are also cooperative breeders, and it's one of the distinguishing characteristics of Australian birds in general, that lots of Australian songbirds in particular work together to raise their young. And I know that's uh, been a, a big part of your research as well. What are the benefits of, you know, offspring sticking around to, to help raise their siblings or, or the next generation? Yeah, so it, it's a it's a bit of a evolutionary puzzle, really. Uh, if you're thinking of uh, of individuals needing to reproduce themselves, um, that they stay with their parents uh, or join a group instead of independent reproduction is um, is uh, something that requires an explanation <laughs> because it doesn't gel with our our theories of uh, of um, trying to maximize your own reproduction. Um, so there are various benefits to that that have been identified. So very often they're relatives. Uh, and um, if you're able to um, contribute more to future generations in terms of your, uh, of your reproductive uh, contribution uh, by helping relatives, uh, then uh, you, from an evolutionary perspective, are just as successful. So it's the famous simile that I would jump in a pond to save two brothers and, and, and eight cousins, um, because they are just as good as, as a reproductive event. Um, that's one part of the story, and it plays out very strongly in purple crowns because they are faithful and therefore uh, related. <laughs> the, the fathers are related to the young. Okay. But there's lots of other benefits, and Nikki's work in particular has uh, uncovered how incredibly um, fine-tuned and strategic the benefits can be. So maybe Nikki should speak to that herself. Sure. So, so they're essentially looking after their own genetics, genetics that are shared in different individuals, but yeah. which, you know, shared with them. Um, so Nikki, that's, that's such a, an interesting part of the research that you've been doing is, you know, what lengths individuals will go to, to either defend the nest or help feed young. Um, are they the main ways that they cooperate? Yeah, so um, so what we call subordinate birds. So, so in um, so for conference, they live in social groups. You've got a, a dominant breeding pair that will get to breed, and then the subordinate birds in the group can yeah will help to raise their young. Um, and uh, what I found through uh, my PhD research is the two main ways in which uh, they can help to raise young is to uh, feed the chicks in the nest. Um, and after they've left the nest as well, when they're young fledgling still, and they're still dependent, um, and they'll help to defend uh, group members and the nest against predators. And so that's a really, really risky behavior. Because of course, by doing that, if you're defending group members against a goshawk, for example, you could potentially get taken yourself. So it's a really risky move. Um, so I wanted to know, well, surely there must be big benefits to this behavior as well, or otherwise it wouldn't be worthwhile. So I really wanted to figure out why exactly these birds do this. Um, and so one of the things that I found out is that um, these helper birds, they will defend the nest against predators um, if they have a pretty good chance of uh, becoming a breeder in the group in the future. So what that means is that they're willing to save these young in the nest so that they'll have a larger group later on when they're a breeder themselves. So they're actually saving their own future helpers. And what I found as well, that when it comes to feeding the chicks in the nest, um, whether they're willing to help with this, it actually depends on who the breeders are that they're helping. So they'll, um, they're most willing to help feed those chicks if they're raising the young of breeders that are a relative 
and that are a potential mate. So these are really valuable group members that are now and in the future as well. So what it means is that these birds are really long-term strategists. They're thinking ahead well into the future um, and they're really strategic in who they're willing to help and why exactly. Um, and it's, yeah, I find it really interesting because it, it shows really well to how you need to understand your species really well and have a lot of knowledge on all the individuals and their life histories to figure out why they do what they do. That's um, an interesting point. And I think we forgot to mention sort of how we, we get that detailed understanding because, you know, this is a population of small birds living in thick habitat and you're trying to understand, you know, their most intimate kind of relationships um, and genetic relatedness as well. To do that, you actually have to catch these birds, don't you? And, and have a way of identifying them easily without catching them again. Can you tell us through, you know, talk us through how you do that? Yeah, so um, the, the way in which we're able to monitor our birds is because we, when we catch them, we put little collared um, bands on their legs. Um, so you can see those really well in this photo here. So they're like little bracelets essentially on their legs. And each bird has a unique combination of these collars on its leg bands. So that essentially gives each bird its, its unique name. Um, so we can then use those bands to individually recognize each bird in the field. Um, so one of the big parts of our field work is uh, going out and catching any new birds so any juveniles or any new immigrants. Um, and then we're able to um, follow them throughout their entire life. So we can then simply go out with our binoculars, look at the birds, see who's who, and then we can keep track of where they are, who they're with and um, what they get up to. And we um, try to monitor all their breeding attempts as well. So we try to find all their nests and uh, monitor whether they succeed or whether they fail and why that is. So by using those different methods, uh, we've been able to really follow birds throughout their life. So um, for each of the birds in the population there at Warnington, we know exactly where it was born. And from those genetics that um, Anne explained earlier as well, we are able to work out who the parents are and who their siblings are. And then by following them in the field, we can work out where they move to, who they might pair up with, um, how many offspring they get throughout their lifetime, and then eventually when they die as well. So we have a lot of information on each individual bird this way. And I believe in the course of the study, I checked this before, but the, the number of individuals you've banded is it's getting up close to 2000 fairy wrens where you've been able to track that level of detail across their whole lives. So 1,847 um, individuals have been tracked in this way, just to give listeners a, an understanding of, you know, the work involved in that. And Nikki, that means working along Annie Creek at Mornington through the dry season, but also th through the wet season when conditions can change very quickly. Um, how do you go about, about accessing these nests when the creek might be in flood? Well, it's a struggle. <laughs> um, so it, it's a lot of um, walking on muddy roads, muddy riverbanks, or trying to cycle along muddy roads to try to get to our, our target group of wrens for the day. Um, it's a lot of wading across murky flooded creeks or swimming across sometimes to try to reach um, our nest and climbing up and then is to try to get a look inside the nest and then uh, check out the contents. Um, and what it also means um, is that, so we place cameras at nests as well, so we can keep track of um, who feeds the chicks, how much, so we can look at some of those detailed behavioral questions and also to keep track of who the predators are at those nests so we can see what makes the nest uh, fail. Um, so in, in that photo that you just showed, it was actually me and one of my field assistants trying to wade out to one of our nests to save one of our nest cameras because we had an unexpected flood come through and obviously we want to save our equipment as much as we can. So, so monitoring nests is a, a large part of this work. Um, and you, you talked about predators, um, both as you know one of the ways that these birds help each other, fending off predators if they're related enough to bother. Um, but what are some of the surprising predators that you've seen approaching the nest? It must be really hard to watch this video of your study species with, you know, all sorts of things coming to eat them. 
Yeah, they don't have an easy life. Um, so uh, from those cameras, I have basic nests. Um, we know that a lot of predators are, are sort of what we would expect. So things like goannas and snakes, and uh, we get some things like goshawks and kookaburras as well. Um, but one of the really surprising ones that um, actually depredates nests a lot more often than we thought are giant centipedes. And that's one that we really didn't expect. Giant centipedes. So this is, and you know, I hope there's no children watching because this is a, a nightmare kind of coming thing. So these are little birds nesting in pandanus. And what does that, you know, what do you see when you look at the camera trap of a giant centipede? How do you know that they're preying on them? Yeah, so, so giant centipedes, they um, tend to go for the nest at nighttime. Um, so the cameras that we have set up at nest, they're motion triggered. So generally I'll, I'll see a video in the middle of the night of um, a female wren suddenly coming off of the nest. Um, so that's the mum. So the mum will usually spend the night on the nest to keep the eggs or the young chicks warm. Um, so I'll suddenly see her leaving the nest. And um, usually we have to go through a fair bit of footage uh, to actually work out why she came off in the first place. Because centipedes take a long time to slowly eat away the eggs or the young chicks. Um, so then about an hour later, I suddenly see the centipede emerge and realize why the female came off the nest in the first place. That's absolutely shocking. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> goshawks, goannas, snakes, they've got a lot to contend with. It sounds like they have, you know, difficult lives as well as, you know, floods. And, you know, depending on the season, this whole area might go under, so they might lose all of their nests. Do you have a good understanding from the, you know, the census of the population that you've been doing, how their numbers have tracked over the course of the study? And, and what are the big impacts on that? Uh, so we've got some ideas. Uh, so we, because we are following everyone in, in real great detail, uh, we, our population census is, uh, you know, ranges from 157 to 298. So we're quite precise in how many birds there are. Um, so what we've seen is a, is a few cycles of increases and decreases in the population. Um, and we started off with, uh, with, with that lower number, uh, around 150 mark. It depends a bit on what time of the year we do the census. Um, and that's more than doubled um, initially in the first 10 years. Uh, and we think there were, that's mainly due to um, uh, the conservation action taken locally. Uh, there were some, some blips. Uh, one of the things that wrens don't deal with very well are droughts. Uh, they breed in response to rain, uh, so if there's there's drought, then uh, the population will uh, stagnate or decline, um, and that's what happened more recently in in the um, sort of the mid tens, <laughs> if you will. Uh, there were some years with drought and the population declined, and uh, subsequently there were some very big wets, uh, and uh, the we saw a, a massive bounce back. Um, uh, that was that was quite interesting. Uh, um, so normally the peak breeding takes place in the wet season uh, because they respond to rain, as I said. And while we get occasional rain in the dry season and certainly um, occasional breeding in the dry season, usually it's the wet. Um, but the wets were so big that many of the nests didn't make it because of those sludge that you describe and what um, uh, Nikki mainly found, uh, because we were safely in Melbourne um, in lockdown, um, while Nikki was, got stuck in Mornington, there are, I guess, are worse things. Um, what she saw is that the birds essentially uh, kept breeding after those very large wets into, well into the dry season. Uh, and we think uh, from, from our detailed research, on what individuals do. Um, if they're unsuccessful, they're much more likely to stop breeding. And given that they had droughts and then massive floods, and there were various other things amongst others, cuckoos, they were very unsuccessful for a long time. And then they just went for it, um, which was surprising. Even after 15 years, we thought we had a better handle on what they would do, but that they would so strongly sort of correct for that lack of success was a really a very nice surprise okay so they can be very responsive to conditions like a lot of Australian wildlife I guess but exactly. um working out just how responsive and I, I remember um 
you know, I've, I've spent time at Mornington looking at these birds. One of the ways you can tell if they're nesting is if they're carrying food. So if they catch an insect and they don't just gobble it up, but they actually carry it, that's one way that you can find the nest. But, you know, at a more basic level, their whole plumage changes when they're breeding. So um, I think one of the projects under your group and uh, was looking at why they do have a purple crown, what, what yes. function that serves. Um, yep. Can you tell us just just briefly how how does that plumage come about and and what's its purpose? Yes, I'll try and be brief. Okay. Um, so uh, we dubbed the, that finding the power of purple. So there's a beautiful purple male in his uh, in his glorious plumage, um, and we were unsure why they are purple because in other fair events the the plumage is strongly related to that uh, that puzzling uh, promiscuous behavior. Uh, and we know that the purple crowns don't do this. So uh, one of my fabulous PhD students, Marie Fan, she did experiments with little plastic purple crown variants that she painstakingly hand painted. Uh, and she found out that it's not for females, not to attract females. Um, earlier work had already shown that females care more about real estate than about beauty in purple crowns. Uh, so um, it's for a ma male to male competition. So combat without um, physical contact, so st standoffs and, and threats, um, the more purple males are a bigger threat. So um, it's the males flexing their, their prettiness to other males rather than trying to woo females for matings. Um, so a, a completely different driver for color than yeah. what we see in other variants, which is- Exactly, a, yeah. Another thing that makes these birds unique. Um, there's actually so much to cover here and we'll come to some questions soon, but um, with a research project that's been running for such a long time, there's really, you know, we could spend hours talking about these birds. Um, we've touched briefly on habitat and how important it is. And when we were chatting earlier and you said that AWC in some respects has made the work of researching these birds harder, um, but in a good way. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yes, yes. So, so when we started um, in, in 2005, when I first set foot on the sanctuary, we could walk along the creeks quite easily and we could spot the birds quite easily as well. And that's because the pandanus was not, not in such good shape um, due to cattle mainly. Uh, and Mornington, of course, has a very intense destocking program uh, in the Mornington Sanctuary. And that started just before our research started. Um, and as the cattle got fewer and fewer, the pandanus got more and more. And now we have to fight our way through this spiky pandanus and the birds are much harder to see. There also are many more birds. So it's even harder to keep track of them. So uh, yes, it was a joy and a pain. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, is there is there more that needs to be done for the conservation of these birds? So, you know, we've talked about habitat as really key. So, you know, removing cattle from those riparian systems has been important. Yep. Fire, I take it, also plays an important role for, for pandanus? Yes. So pandanus very fire sensitive. So very large uh, hot fires are not great. Um, we've got some evidence of a, of a small fire. And again, uh, uh, Nikki did, did all the work there, I should say. Uh, a small fire sort of touching on a, a section of, uh, uh, well, a, a, a section of, um, of any creek. Mm -hmm. And um, the birds didn't like that. So they didn't immediately die. Um, the, the inhabitants of the territories, because fairy events, are very territorial. So if the, if their territory burns, they don't go and share with others. They stay where they are, um, and they didn't manage to breed there. So that area became unproductive for a few years, hmm. uh, and it takes a long time to get back, particularly if there's not a lot of rain. Yeah. And then I guess the converse, um, Nikki, you might like to talk to this, is when there's a lot of rain um, and floods. Is there any work being done on the impact of a changing climate and what, you know, if anything, what might you expect to see as, you know, impacts worsening, could conditions improve in some situations? What are you, what are you asking about climate with these birds? Yeah, so there's a, a few different ways in which you can tackle this. So, so one of the ways in which um, climate might affect um, 
our rent population at Mornington is those more extreme flooding events that we kind of touched on earlier as well. Um, so if that might lower breeding success during the wet season, then potentially they'll start to breed more during the dry season instead, because that's kind of what we've seen the last um, two years as well. So it's, it's still speculative, but we're hoping that um, this flexibility in time of breeding might be good news for the wrens in the long term. I'm That's just, a really sad video. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's hard to watch this clip actually, but it's um, a nest which was inundated, which, you know, you had the the camera trap set on and the birds coming back the next morning. It's tragic to, and, you know, we've, we've seen the impact of flooding on people. Um, I guess, you know, for a bird like this that is tied so closely to that creekside habitat, flooding can be equally devastating. Um, Okay, so so more questions still to answer. And speaking of questions, we might come to the Q&A. So a lot of people have been asking questions in the chat here. Um, and I apologise because I, I know we won't get to all of them, but we will try and take a few before we finish up. Um, all right, so we've had a question about genetics and that, that's something we haven't talked about yet. Um, part of the work is taking genetic samples of some of the individuals. Um, what can you learn? I guess you can take relatedness from that information. Are there any other important bits of information that you get from that genetic analysis? Um, either person can answer this. So it's that's a bit of a work in progress. Um, so we're hoping to really expand our genetic work. Um, the, the main thing that you can get from that is um, inbreeding. So effects of inbreeding, we, we do have a, a very good pedigree of our population. Uh, so because we've been following it for so long, we know how everybody fits together. Um, but we don't know what we started off with in terms of genetic um, uh, diversity. So that's one thing. The other thing is to look at that in more detail across the landscape. Um, what is the importance of birds moving for genetic diversity? Um, but that we haven't really started with that yet. Thus far, we've only looked at, um, at, more, at the very basics. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it's hard work, genetics, and we're very much boots, backpacks, and binoculars sort of people. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, people after AWC's own heart. Um, and, you know, it's been so fantastic to have this long running project um, on an AWC sanctuary. Um, and, you know, I think that's been a, a really wonderful relationship between the, your lab um, and, and the team at Mornington. Which isn't really a question, just, yeah, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> more of that. Um, okay, we've got um, a few more questions. So one here, you know, we've been talking about this population at Annie Creek Mornington Wildlife Sanctuary in, in the central Kimberley, but the species is more widespread than that. There's this Western population, uh, which is the subspecies, uh, and there's another subspecies in the east near the Gulf of Carpentaria. Have any similar studies been done on that population? Is it significantly different? Are they doing the same things? Do you want me to get this one out? <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? Why don't you talk about the landscape stuff we do? The landscape stuff that we do? Yeah. Yeah, so, that, so we only focus on the Western subspecies. Um, so the, the Western subspecies is listed as endangered, whereas the Eastern subspecies is not. Um, so the, the and yeah, that, that's because the Western subspecies is so reliant on pandanus and we have those key threats in the Kimberley of cattle and um, fire. And we do see that. So we, we do actually do larger surveys every year as well. Um, so we have this population along 15 kilometers of waterways at Mornington that we study really, really intensely. Um, and then once a year, we do also go further out to um, other sites. Um, so we, we go to different places in about a 30, 40 kilometer radius from Mornington um, to look at how the fair ends are doing there as well. Um, and they vary in um, like whether they've been uh, destocked, for example, or not. There are some sites that are on Mornington, some that are outside. And um, in those different populations, we have seen fluctuations in uh, fair in numbers as well. Um, 
which for a large part is also to do with things like droughts and, and big wet seasons and things like that. Um, but nowhere have we seen that clear increase in number of fair ends like we have seen at Mornington because it's been destocked. Mm. Yeah, so nowhere else are they studied at this level. Really. Yeah, they're not. We, we know there's, there's been research done. Like, I don't want to say that, that we're the only ones, um, but, uh, but this level of detail, certainly not. Um, the, there certainly are other variants that are not dependent on pandanus. They, they breed in cane grass, but a lot of the other problems seem to be the same. So you just replace cane grass with pandanus. And the Eastern one, we, we know much less about. Uh, I know somebody's studying them, but um, I, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions about dispersal here. And um, do we know whether the population at Mornington on Annie Creek is connected with other West Kimberley populations? Um, Nikki, how do you find out um, whether they're actually dispersing? Like, what's what are you looking for there? So um, if we're interested in like long distance dispersal, so variants that really move between different populations, um, that's what we use those surveys for that I just mentioned, where we go out to, to other rivers and creeks in a wider radius. Um, and so what we're looking for is birds with collarbands on their legs, because that's how we know we banded them. They've come from Annie Creek or the Atcock River, and we can look at the combination of collars on their legs to um, identify which individual bird it is. And that's how we have a pretty unique system where we can say for sure whether a bird has simply moved out of the population or whether it's died if it suddenly disappears from um, our core little study area. Okay, cool. And there's been, like, I think one of them traveled 60 kilometers or something, which was uh, an extreme case of this very small bird covering a lot of um, inhospitable country, uh, you know, bigger rivers, drier country to get to an area of suitable habitat. So they're obviously doing more than just sticking along that, that bit of creek. There are these occasional dispersal events. Um, so fascinating to learn how that plays into the, you know, the conservation of the species as a whole. Um, and I think, yeah, that, that will be really interesting for, for conservation um, yeah. from, from that side of things. Absolutely. This has been a wonderful conversation, but I think we'll finish up. So thank you so much, Nikki, for taking the time to tune in from the Kimberley and Anne from, from Monash University, where you've been leading this work. It's been wonderful to speak to you both. Thank you very you much. Too. Thanks, Joey. I love talking about fairy events. I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should say too, if people are interested, there's a lot of recent publications out of your lab. So um, where possible, we'll share any of those research publications on the AWC website. Um, there's also some really good articles in places like Australian Geographic and of course in AWC's magazine, Wildlife Matters. If you're not a subscriber to Wildlife Matters, you can go to our website, australianwildlife.org and sign up there. You can get our email updates, which come out regularly with all the news from around our sanctuaries and partnership sites. Um, or you can become a supporter. And AWC's support of research like this is really important for the conservation that we're trying to deliver around the country. We couldn't do it without your support. So please do consider making a donation to AWC while you're there. You can also catch up on previous webinars at australianwildlife.org and I'll see you next time. <laughs>